presentation. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to give you a, a little bit of a grand overview of, of sort of the, uh, my research area. Uh, and in recent years, I've been concerned quite a bit with hydrodynamical simulations of galaxy formation. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a personal view on this field, um, uh, starting a bit with the history and uh, setting this in context, discussing a bit the current state uh, of this area, you know, how, what are the successes and what are the challenges, and give you a bit of a personal maybe outlook on what where I see some of the challenges and what we are going to see in the next couple of years. So <clears throat> Lambda CDM is our cosmological model that we, we love and, and cherish, you know, and it's giving us uh, initial conditions that are precisely laid down. And I've been studying in my work mostly uh, computational structure formation where I took the initial conditions left behind by the Big Bang, which we constrain, of course, with the beautiful CMB observation and other cosmological probes to high precision, use them as initial conditions, and then evolve it forward in time. And you all know that as far as the dark matter is concerned, we, we can carry this out with high precision. And these simulations have been instrumental, the dark matter only calculations to, for example, tell us you know, how many nonlinear objects of a given mass exist. Uh, the halo mass function of the internal structure, dark matter halos have been clarified. In fact, this is fairly interesting. If you zoom in in one of these objects, you get this uh, sea of dark matter substructures in halos. And from this image alone, uh, you couldn't tell whether this is a galaxy cluster, a Milky Way system, or a dwarf galaxy. They, they all look the same. They are nearly scale invariant. Of course, when, once we are adding the baryons, uh, this will change. The scale invariance, the near scale invariance of these systems will go away. So as far as dark matter is concerned, the problem is kind of cold dark matter is kind of solved. Of course, uh, uh, the missing item here is that we don't actually know what the dark matter is in the end. We still explore other alternatives, but the candidate, the vanilla candidate to this day is still a sort of wimp like particle, uh, a massive um, weakly interacting particle behaving as cold dark matter. And in that limit, we have very accurate simulation predictions, except that in principle, uh, we don't yet know necessarily what is the structure of the smallest halo. So that was an, a somewhat unclear open issue uh, until I think, let's say, recently, because there's new work by Jay Wang and uh, Sona Bozi and, and co workers, and I was also involved in this, where we tried to address this with a series of extreme zoom calculations. And I just want to show you this here. This is a 500 megaparsec parent calculation, the original millennium volume just updated to the Planck cosmology, dark matter only. And then through a sequence of eight zoom calculations, we have zoomed into um, objects trying to uncover in a gigantic uh, cosmological volume the smallest dark matter halos that form. Those will be for a canonical WIMP of about 100 GeV particle uh, of Earth-sized dark matter halos. Um, and in fact, we reach here now a mass resolution of 10 to the minus 11 solar masses, which I think is quite good, in a box that <laughs> contains 10 to the 19 solar masses, right? So this is, I think, a, a tribute to what you can do uh, these days in, in a truly multi-scale calculation. So this is an extreme zoom. Of course, the dark matter problem is comparatively simple. Still, uh, doing such extreme zooms over 30 order of magnitudes is also numerically very hard. That's why this uh, was requiring us also to change the simulation codes multiple times to actually re reach the required accuracy. But at the end, we get a fairly interesting result, not fully unexpected, because the NFW, or rather Anasto profile, have been demonstrated before to match the dark matter profiles very well for much bigger halos. Now it turns out they also match to high accuracy even the smallest dark matter halos that form. So the Earth mass dark matter halos are also uh, matched to about 7% accuracy with the Anasto profile, so over these uh, very large dynamic mass, uh, range in mass. More interesting is the concentration mass relationship. This is something that has been <coughs> explored a lot and people have used this uh, typically considered massive systems to write down you know, empirical fits for the concentration mass relationship. And when you extrapolate this to so the thermal cutoff scale, 10 to the minus six solar masses, or so sort of an Earth mass, where you expect the smallest halos in this canonical wind model, you see that these predictions are actually very different from what we find in the end. There was one theoretical model by Ludlow that describes precisely this finding, and uh, <coughs> that has sort of been confirmed. This is a model that relates the concentration of dark matter halos to the mass accretion history. 
it works astonishingly well, as you see here. It's matching the uh, simulation results in the end very, very well. Why does it matter? Well, it matters for questions like uh, dark matter annihilation. Uh, this uh, concentration mass relation leads then to a correction of predictions for the annihilation flux by about a factor of 10 or so because of the soft clumping. So now, uh, with this little side remark on the dark matter side of things, so this is a small update from that front, let me turn to the hydro simulations. Um, now, this is something that has been, of course, been attempted uh, really early on. So these are some old results from 15, 20 years ago, almost, well, 15, 10 years ago. Uh, attempts to simulate uh, cosmological boxes with the baryonic physics included, and then forming directly the galaxies. And one famous problem that surfaced immediately early on is the so-called overcooling catastrophe, how this has been uh, termed, namely the fact that uh, even in, in, in crappy resolution simulations, the gas will cool and condense in the dark matter halos. And there's nothing really that stops it. Typically, it will turn into stars. You predict star formation rates that are far higher than what's observed in the real universe. And um, predictions early, this is you know, an early prediction for the cosmic star formation rate history. We see here early data, an over prediction of by a factor of three or five or so. If you increase the resolution, it gets worse, um, and you turn way more barons into stars than, than you would expect. And predictions for the galaxy luminosity function, so 10 years ago, looked like something like this. right? You, here is a Schechter function of the observed galaxy luminosity function. There's a very steep faint end in this hyper simulation. There's an excess at the bright end, and you don't fit the knee. So it could hardly be worse than that. So the, the shape was, was very bad. <laughs> um, complete failure, but um, and you know if you go back to this history, you will see that Nowadays, of course, we are doing, doing much better. And uh, I'll get to this, but here was an early attempt of a, of a disk galaxy formation. Um, and the disk is there at, at redshift zero, but it's uh, actually pathetically uh, small compared to the big sphere that has also formed. And the rotation curve of this Milky Way-sized galaxy shoots up to 450 kilometers a second or so at the center. as uh, quite unlike a flat rotation curve that you would expect from Milky Way. So also here, uh, a strong failure. Um, and that's because of the same problem. The variants settled into the center, and you make an uh, extremely massive bulge that shouldn't be there. <clears throat> if you look back in, rec in the recent decade, though, uh, suddenly uh, much more successful disk galaxy simulations appeared. Here are different examples, Scania Beko, Luedes, uh, Argels, um, and then more recently, Ferdberg, Stinson, Alma, Marinacci, Phil Hopkins. You see that these galaxies get quickly prettier over the years <laughs> uh, because they are rendered um, more nicely. But they also they also uh, match the properties of these galaxies much much better. And um, you know this is what we are currently at it. Um, so this is uh, our newest Arepo model, um, or the, uh, more resolved ISM model. And you see, if you put the dust lanes on top, it looks much nicer and much closer to reality. And um, but you know, this from a distance, you could mistake maybe with a real, for a real observed galaxy. So I think the progress here is, is kind of stunning over the course of 10 years. And so multiple groups are able to simulate hydrodynamically galaxies at that time. So that's quite remarkable. Why, why was there this progress? I think there are two fundamental reasons. And I don't want to dwell on, on all of them, because there's a large shopping list of so-called feedback processes that fight the overcooling that regulates star formation in the sense um, that, that we observe. And uh, the, the two main <coughs> culprits here are uh, effects related to stellar evolution. So supernova explosions is a clear traditional energy source that we know is there. Stellar winds and uh, you know, also the radiation fields by massive stars and black hole activity to quench the star formation massive systems. But uh, this is uh, only sort of the, the main contenders here. We, we think that there might be additional physics that's relevant uh, relating to, for example, the uh, radiation fields, um, radiation transfer, radiation pressure and dust, or, or non-thermal particle populations, cosmic rays, which I'll also later talk a little bit about more. Maybe MHD effects, magnetohydrodynamics plays a role as well. Or exotic physics, you, you find many speculations of what could curtail uh, star formation galaxies. And the other big uh, issue, I think, also, um, even though that's more debated, how relevant this is, I do think that the numerical methods themselves have become more accurate as well. 
Here we developed, uh, for example, because of problems with the gadget code, which is a smooth particle hydrodynamics technique, which used to be very popular, um, but has a, a very noisy rendering of the uh, hydrodynamics and also has problems in uh, suppressing fluid instabilities from growing in, under certain conditions. We developed this moving mesh code, our repo, and here you see a comparison uh, of a disk galaxy formation calculation where the same initial conditions was, was simulated with the same physics in this case using two completely different hydrodynamical solvers. And uh, in both cases, a disk system so, uh, is formed, but you see very clearly that the uh, moving mesh calculation seems to be making a bigger disk, uh, a, a much less noisy, density field. Um, and these effects are there. Um, the accuracy of uh, these numerical methods differs substantially. And what's debated basically among the, the pundits here is, is whether this matters, because in the end, because of the uncertainties involved uh, with these baryonic physics processes, which we have to often parameterize somehow uh, semi-empirically or heuristically. And you can absorb maybe some of the errors in the codes in this parameterization. And um, I think this is uh, partially true, but I think it's a dangerous road to go down. So I would ultimately like to have a predictive um, numerical solver um, where I can rely on an accurate solution of the underlying partial differential equation that we're trying to to compute. So um, nowadays, uh, with these improved codes, uh, both the OSPI SPH codes have also been improved. Uh, and I don't think they are as good as the mesh codes still, but they are uh, having improved a lot. And then different groups have uh, you know, now ran in the recent years very large volumes, cosmological volumes, where not only the dark matter was simulated, but baryons as well. Uh, and the most important physical process is regulating galaxy formation or determining it. That is radiative cooling, stellar uh, star formation, and some feedback process related to star formation, some black hole growth, and some feedback process related to black hole growth. And here are some of the projects, uh, Illustris, Horizon AGM, Magneticom, Eagle, and so on. These are uh, some of the more well-known ones. Uh, it's not a complete list. And, and more recently, Illustris TNG, which I'll refer to a little bit more. And with Illustris, this was in 2014, we, we managed um, um, for the first time to reproduce the morphological mix of galaxies. I think this was an important uh, first success that um, uh, these calculation, even though that wasn't you know, somehow put in, produced different shapes of galaxies, namely disk systems of you know, two, roughly uh, two arms, bar systems, pure disk system ellipticals, and then you can arrange that sort of as a two-uniform diagram. Uh, and uh, also the morphological mix changes with, as a function of stellar mass roughly like observed. So that was maybe the, the most important success here. The detailed properties and galaxies were partially successful too, but there were also discrepancies. And uh, in particular, we still had two big galaxies. That's why in recent years we turned to the next generation illustrious model, again run with this moving mesh code. And this time uh, the idea was to uh, look at different volume, so uh, here is a 50 megaparsec box, TNG50, 100 megaparsec box, and 300, with the idea being that due to computation limitations, we would like to address a fairly large uh, you know, volume at, at very good mass resolution to see the smallest galaxies. This you can't afford to do in these very large volumes, so the yeah, way out is to restrict uh, your volume, then be content, for example, 50 megaparsec, and then you, however, don't see rare systems like rich galaxy clusters. But by overlapping uh, these volumes with overlapping mass resolution, again, they patch together a full, uh, you know, consistent picture of all the objects that are there. That at least is the idea. But even, I should say, for cosmological applications, these 300 megaparsec volume is basically not large enough. The baryonic acoustic oscillations are basically hardly in there in this volume. And if, then only with a few modes. So, um, that is one of the challenges to the future to have still larger hydro simulations because they are so mongos expensive. That's a, a actually real, real difficulty. Um, in fact, these TNG runs for this we already needed a big supercomputer. This was this was run this machine, a great computer in, in Stuttgart, and, and the TNG 50 calculation. I'll show you some one uh, couple of results late in a minute. Consumed about 100 million CPU hours. So this is one of the most expensive runs in the field so far. So it's not a cheap uh, way to do science for sure. So and um, unfortunately, 
And once you have done the calculation, it's also not easy to fix, you know, change it and do another one, one, one big problem. Um, just to give you a visual impression, here is a, a nice movie that um, Bill Nelson rendered. Uh, um, the formation of a disk-like galaxy, in, in this case a small cutout from the TNG-50 simulation box. What you see here in the background is the gas flow. Um, here's a, a redshift counter, which is redshift 3.56-ish, and the other insets here. This is the dark matter backbone. Here are the stars, and uh, this is, well, I forgot what this is. Bottom right. Should also be the gas. Huh? Shai, do you remember what this is? <laughs> I, I, I think don't it's know. just the gas and zoomed in. Yeah. Zoomed in, I guess. Yeah, yeah. should also be the gas. Um, right, but we are approaching, you, know, in the, you see how, how uh, wild actually the, the, the gas flows are. This is, is a, a multi phase uh, gas distribution. It's very, very turbulent, messy. There's inflow along the uh, Along filamentary directions. Here is already a rotation supported gas disk form. This is the metallicity field. You see a, a relatively large enrichment of uh, uh, much of the volume. Um, and uh, around this time is sort of the heyday of this galaxy formation. Sets in at, at redshift uh, two ish or so. And uh, these disks are resilient to, to some mergers. I mean, if it's not too big. It's also a realization that in the past it was all thought that the emergence necessarily destroyed this, but these hybrid simulations are regrowing this if there's not enough gas around fairly quickly, unless the merger is, is very large. And you know, you see that um, things quiet down now. Uh, here's the star formation rate, and you get at the end, uh, uh, you know, a nice little uh, disk galaxy that keeps rotating for a while. And uh, you also notice that. Uh, the evolution has noticeably quieted down. The, these disks uh, spend a couple of giga years then in sort of secular evolution at the end and still grow, grow in mass. Um, what's interesting, so I just want to very quickly guide you through some key results. So these cosmological simulations are now able to match uh, a pretty large uh, amount of data. I give you just a few examples. Here is the color distribution. Uh, which uh, the TNG simulation for the first time matches with this accuracy. So you reproduce basically the bimodal color distribution seen in Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and this is you know, m m matched nicely as a, uh, for different stellar mass spins. And uh, the appearance of this red sequence is a, is a feature here of the AGN feedback. So the one key physics prescription that was modified going to this next generation elastic simulation was actually modeling of supermassive black holes and their uh, feedback impacts. And we rely on that uh, very much to produce quenched galaxies. So this is entirely in the TNG calculations, something that comes about uh, from the modeling of the black hole physics and the kinetic feedback prescription that we adopted <coughs> here to produce basically, uh, motivated by some observations of red geyser galaxies, produce uh, quenched systems. So that, was an important uh, first test that this kind of works. And uh, what's also interesting, and that isn't calibrated in any way, is that the pre predicted galaxy populations, they match clustering data very well. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is still one of the most accurate measurements of the, the clustering of galaxies uh, in the present day universe. And this is uh, data that is really of exquisite precision. You see here uh, the two point correlation function of uh, galaxies in different stellar mass spins in black dots from Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and the L bars here are smaller than the dots, so this is really very precise. And um, it is reassuring that these hydro simulations match uh, in their clustering predictions and what we see in SDSS without additional tuning. And this also works more or less uh, for red and blue galaxies separately. And so the, the quenched systems are essentially at the right place and they have roughly the right stellar masses as well. Um, so that is uh, that is encouraging for using these hyper simulations. Then for you know for cosmological studies, you can, for example, directly predict bias of different galaxy types, uh, or look at things like scale dependent bias. <clears throat> what they also predict is that uh, the Bernic, if uh, similar, you know, there are impacts of Bernic physics on the dark matter or the total matter clustering. This is shown in this diagram. It's a comparison between the matter power spectrum in these full physics hydro simulations relative to equivalent dark matter only simulations where the barons are also represented uh, by dark matter. And in this comparison plot from 
Kisai, actually also the, our TNG results are included, as well as other simulation projects, um, Illustris, Horizon AGN, OLS, and Eagle. And uh, you see that they universally on, on sort of uh, somewhat nonlinear scales already, or mild nonlinear scales of K around 10 ish or so, there, there's a huge deficit of about 20% in the meta uh, power spectrum. And this is attributed to AGN as well. So without the AGN, you don't get this. This is because barons are pushed out of uh, poor galaxy clusters by, by black holes. And uh, the, the simulation models that reproduce also the baron fraction in these poor clusters, which are basically these models, they, they all predict roughly the same size of the effect. So these things are related, so the, it's not completely hopeless. Uh, you know, to, to, you know, to, we think that maybe there's a chance to, to pin down that, not to the percent accuracy that you would like to in cosmology, but um, it is clear that, for example, the Lustris model that predicted here almost 40%, and it's because uh, it had a too strong AGN feedback and it expelled too many baryons out of these halos. And then the effect was overall too large. Here's a result from analysis from Shai, looking at the galaxy sizes um, uh, in TNG. This is something that didn't used to work uh, in previous calculations, but now these models also basically get the right, the right stellar masses and the right sizes of galaxies, which is quite nice. In fact, even the morphological indicators, uh, if you look in this plane of Gini coefficient versus M20, this is a, uh, some concentration measure, then, then you, you get fairly decent agreement in the morphological properties in detail between uh, something like Elastis and Chimpanza. So that's a non-trivial, I think, success. But you know, uh, one shouldn't be carried away too much by this, but rather focus on the more interesting sort of predictions that are maybe discrepant with data. Here's, here's sort of one, for example, this is a sort of velocity decomposition um, of, um, again, Milky Way sized galaxies here stacked from TNG. And the total meta profile gives you this nice flat rotation curve, which matches uh, data points reasonably well, the dark matter. But what's then quite different uh, uh, between mass models for the Milky Way, here one from, from Bowie and Riggs, which is here, the, uh, I think this is the, uh, the stars that Bobby and Riggs predict yeah, up, up, up there, and, and the, the dark matter here. But the dark matter that we find in, in the simulations, you see, is, is much more concentrated. So the, the galaxies are dominated by dark matter all the way in, basically, almost. And that is not what uh, many of the mass modelers for the Milky Way infer. So there's a really very substantial discrepancy. And a similar type of problem has been reported by Reinhard Genzel for higher redshift galaxies, dark matter deficient galaxies. We have to see what to make out of that. But these calculations that predict you know, adiabatically contracted dark matter halos for the most part. And uh, that is uh, one of the interesting challenges. Here's another success uh, in the, in the uh, metal profiles, but I don't, don't want to stress the successes now more, but you know, come to some other things, newer things on the magnetic field amplifications. But first, let me make one thing, of course, you know, there is the question of what, what you put in is what you get out. So some properties are, are not predictions, they are just confirmations of your tuning. And in the uh, TNG model, this is basically the stellar mass function, uh, which you see here, because we developed um, the feedback models to get the stellar masses sufficiently down and onto the abundance matching diagram to basically come out with a sensible luminosity function of galaxies. So that is not uh, surprising that this works in the end. Um, we worked really hard to make the black holes in particular being able to quench these galaxies sufficiently strongly. And likewise, since I mentioned the gas fractions in the TNG system, in the TNG models, we made sure that the gas fraction in poor galaxy clusters comes about right, because that was a uh, main, main failure in our older calculations. And so that is, in that sense, something that we looked at in the calibration. And it's not surprising that it comes out right. And that, as I said, you know, this also tells you that the 20% suppression in the power spectrum is what you expect from this, uh, this size of, of barren expulsion. Here is uh, some words on, on uh, numerical conversions. Re remains a big challenge in, in these calculations. Um, but because we have a, a sequence of simulations, we can actually use that to interpolate to sort of the result you expect for an infinite resolution. And um, that's something that we can do almost for any quantity. We can you know, 
study the resolution impacts um, over a very wide uh, range in uh, dynamic range, and then predict um, the continuum result, if you want, for, for finite usual infinite resolution. And for some things, this works very well. So you, you can uh, you know, also get nominal conversions um, for large systems. It's very hard, for example, are things like the stellar disk height uh, in, in disk galaxies. It's numerically very hard to get um, full conversions. You see here, for example, a resolution test um, uh, where you know, that clearly shows that you get thinner disks, the better the resolution becomes. So there are effects like disk heating. Those are, our, which is often, uh, you know, mistakenly attributed to the gravitational softening lengths. And that is not the primary impact here. So it's really the, the particle number, or, or rather the mass resolution that we're having. Sorry, Volker, if you're going to, you can just go back. You're getting higher, bigger scale heights at higher resolution, it looks like, when you have smaller uh, gravitational softening? Um, yes, that's because, yes, that's true. Yeah. It's more heating here. It's to body heating it or something of that nature. Yeah. It's almost constant. I mean, I, I would actually say there's a there's probably a tiny trend, um, but it's um, almost flat, I would say. But there is a sense of a slightly stronger heating here. Yeah. Um, but you know, let me come to to predictions from the simulations. Um, that's that's what I find, and I give you a few examples of maybe some unexpected things. For example, um, here's one that that shows a a correlation between the disk scale length of uh, disk galaxies and the, the black hole size or growth. And that, in a sense, you could interpret this. So the bigger the black hole is, the shorter the disk scale length on average. That probably shows uh, that uh, the recent growth of the black hole has an impact on the, on the, you know, the amount of the disk growth you see uh, because of the heating impact of the black hole. We also have uh, added magnetic fields. Um, in these uh, simulations, so here's a, uh, let me just show you, show you a short movie. This is a, a small section from one of the TNG 100. It's the TNG 100 simulation, and it's a bit bright here, but you probably see this filamentary structure, and, and what's actually colored here is now uh, magnetic field strength. And we have been, when you consider one of these halos, you'll see that uh, you know it's uh, actually moving. And the inflow here is, is driving um, turbulence in the system. And this turbulence, as I show you now, is, is a, a main factor in amplifying magnetic fields through a small-scale turbulent dynamo. Uh, <clears throat> and this, um, this is something we have studied a bit. So we, we looked at uh, magnetic field amplification in some of these halos. And we think it's, uh, we, we find a, a very strong amplification of the, the magnetic field to micro Gauss strengths in the center. You see in the velocity field here, uh, Kolmogorov turbulent cascade, and then a consensus uh, small scale dynamo that brings up the magnetic field rather quickly, first in the center and then later out in the galaxies. And um, the fields that we then end up with, they are close to equipartition. These are two examples. Here's a comparison to a, a further rotation map of M51. So they statistically are actually fairly consistent. Uh, and if you look at uh, full sky Faraday rotation maps of some of our simulated galaxies. This is now actually from Auriga, which are zoom simulations of a model um, of Milky Way size systems. It's basically the same code that's used in TNG. It's only a small difference in the in the black hole model, which is not very relevant for for uh, Milky Way size systems. And you see that you know by eye uh, these Faraday rotation maps are actually looking stunningly similar. Um, and also magnetic field profiles. Uh, here are some comparisons between radial magnetic field profiles in blue with typical profiles in, in disk galaxies. They, they get, you know, you get up to B fields that are very reasonable. Um, and then the dynamo saturates when, when you are uh, at some fraction of the equipartition, typically. Um, and just as a, as a, you know, this sort of uh, magnetic amplification you see also in the other contexts here, I show you. I want to just show you a, as a sort of paratentical remark, the side project uh, which I was involved in, where we applied the Ripaco to the problem of uh, stellar mergers of the two um, massive main sequence stars. And um, so basically, these stars here get into contact. And um, this is a nine solar mass and an eight solar mass star. And then during the merge, eventually, the nine, nine solar mass stars 
funnels material onto the surface of the eight solar mass stars, and then very quickly these systems merge, um, make a more massive star. Um, then you know this is for a couple of days here, ten days, and then it will still take a thousand years or so until this uh, return. This star uh, sheds some further mass and returns to to thermal equilibrium. Um, but what's interesting is that um, to look at the magnetic field during this evolution. So this is the same merger now, <laughs> and what you what you see here is that um, from this material that streams onto the smaller star, um, there's actually an MRI instability creating a strong turbulent flow, which very rapidly, via again a, a small scale turbulent dynamo in this um, MRI driven turbulence, amplifies the magnetic field. In this case, in the remnant star to about 10 to the 7 Gauss. And um, that's interesting because um, this is roughly the, the magnetic field strengths that you observe in so-called magnetic massive stars, which are appearing often as blue stragglers. And it's a mystery where this magnetic field strength comes from. And the simulation shows it could very well be generated uh, by uh, just the plain merger of two, two of these massive stars. And the, the fre frequency of the expected merger frequency matches uh, the frequency of these uh, massive blue, uh, these blue stragglers, basically, in the galaxy. And if they then collapse, uh, may co-collapse sometime later, uh, the flux is conserved, it will be amplified uh, by a billion times to about you know, 10 to the 16 Gauss or so, and get a neutron star with 10 to the 16 Gauss and magnetars. So that would be a channel to, to maybe make, make magnetars. And um, here you basically saw that the Arepo code, which is this moving mesh code, is particularly good at uh, advecting, uh, you know, rapidly if needed, uh, materials through space, and that's, uh, this is what uh, was relevant in this particular calculation. Another type of application here would, for example, be the tidal resorption of stars uh, in the field of a black hole where we also applied this code uh, and got some quite interesting results. So let me um, now turn maybe a bit uh, to some trends for the future and say something about that um, as well. So uh, here is a diagram um, that shows the current sort of field, in a way, uh, many of the sim famous simulation projects in, in one common diagram in, in axis where we have the number of uh, simulated galaxies and the bionic mass resolution on the vertical there. Uh, and you can basically uh, identify here so two different kind of strategic directions where you can push for. You can either go you know, for uh, one or two galaxies or a few and, and uh, invest your time in, in upping the resolution very much. These are the so-called Zoom projects like FIRE or RIGA, um, they achieve the best resolution, uh, typically, of course. And then you have the classic cosmological boxes that go sort of horizontally to large volumes. And they are naturally poor in resolution. And with TNG50, we kind of try to push sort of into the diagonal, uh, making or compromising on the volume, but still having a very good mass resolution. So kind of trying to achieve uh, the mass resolution that's typically uh, only reached in the zoom calculation, but then still having hundreds of systems, so you can then make uh, statistics and you, you can understand sort of the, uh, uh, the full population mix still at some level, which is traditionally uh, the, the problem if you just focus on a single system, it's then often very hard to tell uh, is it a peculiar galaxy or, or is it typical. Um, that is what team systems like, you know, simulations like team, team G50 can do. <laughs> But despite of all these nice successes, I think one, one central problem that's, of course, not resolved in TNG50 is, um, well, is, you know, what is the physics that regulates star formation in the center? And in particular, what's the physics that expels some of the baryons out of the halo? Because we know lambda CDM can only uh, create a successful galaxy luminosity function if many halos get rid of a substantial fraction of their baryons. And uh, how this is accomplished is, is, is kind of hard to understand in detail. And we're using wind models that are basically put in by hand, tuned to some observations and tuned to the desired outcome as well. And uh, you know what the question is in the future, you know, what do we do about this problem? How do we make progress? And the different types of ideas around. And, and currently, uh, a lot of uh, interest is uh, invested basically on the circumgalactic medium here, because this is lower density gas, uh, gas that we can potentially simulate up in issue reasonably well. Uh, and here you have interactions of flows uh, that come in and uh, winds that come out. And you have also observational ways to probe 
the state of this gas and its uh, temperature, its uh, uh, density structure, and so on, its metallicity content. So that's something that we, we are trying to do and uh, also improve our simulation predictions. And one, one thing we realized is that, and other groups too, that you, you can, with the adaptive resolution of the mesh codes, try, for example, to place the resolution in the CGM directly and resolve that better. Uh, not uh, like traditionally it's done having just a Lagrangian resolution criterion. And so the idea is basically to relatively cheaply up the resolution in this region without changing anything in the very dense phase, which you anyhow, it's still harder to understand. So several people, several groups pursue this idea to study the CGM with this uh, improved resolution. And if you do this, one, one interesting thing, we can also do this with the magnetic field. So you will see here uh, one of these calculations with improved CGM resolution. In the left is the magnetic field structure. In the right is the magnetic, uh, is the metallicity. And the, the velocity field is uh, overlaid. I'm not sure you can make this out. Maybe in the front row, there are these three, three arches here. This is actually the velocity field. And similar here, you see the B field, vector field overlaid in, the, in this image. And um, you know, what we found, for example, interestingly, is that the B field is actually amplified strongly and quickly in the disk of the galaxy by the small scale dynamo there. But we also see that the uh, B field in the CGM is coming partially from the center. And it's expelled along with the winds and also along with the metals. That's why there is a strong correlation at high redshift between the, the metal, metallicity, basically per voxel, per volume element, and the B field which at late times gets washed out because at late times we then see also a, a turbulent small scale dynamo operating in the CGM itself. So we can prove this uh, by looking at the uh, power spectrum again of the velocity field and the B field and it follows the, the theory of a subsonic uh, turbulent dynamo relatively well. So that's I think what, what happens. And that brings up the B field at the end to roughly uniform strength in the uh, CGM. It's highly turbulent field it's, however, ordered partially by some of these winds. Nowhere, however, it is dynamically important. So if you look at the plasma beta, you get uh, basically values of around 10 or so for most of the, of the CGM. So it's an interesting thing, but it's not dynamically important. But it will play a role, and I come to this now in, in the context of, of cosmic rays. So the non-thermal particle populations are a, a very popular idea to, to maybe have a, a physics uh, a means to drive galactic winds and outflows. And unfortunately, simulating a non-thermal particle population cosmic rays, that's a really uh, a multi-scale problem par excellence, right? Because if you, if you look at the Milky Way galaxy disk of a size of, say, 10 to the 4 parsec, but the, uh, the gyro orbit of a GV cosmic ray, which is sort of uh, dominating the pressure, this is at the level of 10 to the minus 6 parsec. So you know this is 10 orders of magnitude smaller. So right away, you cannot do the real plasma physics of you know, following the individual protons around in a kinetic model. This is, of course, not possible. So you have to come up with more simplified prescriptions. And um, there are all sorts of uh, two fluid models that people propose where the plasma physics of the cosmic ray transport is, is simplified, approximated as a fluid that's coupled tightly to the magnetic field evolution uh, through the gyration and the scattering of the cosmic ray particles on the magnetic field irregularities. So that's what needs to be developed, an effective two-fluid theory, ideally also taking account of the spectral representation of the cosmic ray population, which is another dimension which is making this uh, very nasty numerically. Um, spare you some of the equations, but show you some of the results that, that motivated this. Salim, uh, Greg Pines, and I think a student of Greg, is it a student of you? you um, Yes. Yeah. Anyhow, this was one of the very nice uh, initial papers showing that you get very strong cosmic ray driven outflows. And that work, other groups also uh, uh, you know, chimed in and showed that you, once you add cosmic ray physics, you get actually nicely uh, cosmic ray driven winds, polar, bipolar outflows from this galaxy. Exactly what we want. And that happens because the cosmic rays are um, having a, a relativistic equation <coughs> state. Um, there's the park instability field lines open up into the halo. They can stream out into the halo. And as the cosmic ray fluid goes to lower density, the pressure doesn't decay away as fast because of the 4 3rd adiabatic index compared to the 5 3rd of the thermal gas. And so once you have a composite of a thermal gas and a cosmic ray, 
pr partially pressurized uh, by cosmic rays. Once you move it to lower density, you quickly become cosmic ray dominated. Turns out also the dissipation process in cosmic rays are slower than the cooling losses. So the energy stored in cosmic rays stays around. And you can set, set up a cosmic ray pressure gradient in the halo to drive these winds. So it's a very nice idea. Uh, and the cosmic ray origin is, of course, in supernova explosions. So they are believed to transform at least 10% or so of the original energy will appear first in cosmic rays. So you have a, a clear source. Um, you have uh, clear physics that could drive wind. And so that's why people pursue this. And you know, if you study that as a function of halo mass, you find that the wind strength you're getting is modulated with the halo mass in an interesting way. It, uh, the mass loading strongly increases towards lower mass halos. That's exactly the type of scaling we put in by hand, normally in our models. So here you have it kind of naturally appearing from the physics. Likewise, the energy loading of these cosmic radiant winds is basically constant <coughs> across halo mass. Also, the standard assumption that's made in the uh, successful wind model. So looks like a drop in replacement for the, you know, by hand driving of the winds. Now, unfortunately, uh, so far at least, our current attempts to make this work also in cosmological simulations are, are produce quite mixed results. This is sort of our most recent one. Here is a, a Milky Way sized galaxy simulated sort of in our classic way where we don't have uh, cosmic ray physics included. And then three different cosmic ray models here with different transport processes. And that's sort of the crux of the cosmic ray physics. We don't really know very well how the, the underlying plasma physics needs to be simplified into an effective diffusion coefficient or also uh, effective, or, you know, it should be take streaming account, into account or a mix of diffusion and streaming or should uh, the alphane he heating be included and so on. So basically that um, coupling is unclear. And the outcome now for this, this galaxy depends sensitively on what you assume for the transport uh, processes. Here, for example, you see that for uh, just another sort of diffusion or advection, when the, the disks look uh, uh, very different, they, they have the same stellar mass, but suddenly they're very, very small, don't, look, uh, have, don't have the right scale size anymore, don't have the right rotation curve. It's better if the uh, dissipation processes are included, uh, so-called alphane cooling. This uh, takes account of the fact that the streaming cosmic rays along the magnetic field lines, they will excite um, alphane ray to require the streaming instabilities, basically wiggles on the field lines on which they scatter. And that's, a, that's a, in the streaming case, it's a, it's a loss process for the cosmic ray and likewise the heating um, of the background. And in that case, if we, then you know you get at least a kind of a decent disk system, somewhat smaller, so that might be okay. And uh, we think that the reason why these disk galaxies are, are, are now very different is because the CGM structure changes very, very much. The cosmic ray pressure in the halo modifies the inflow, um, prevents uh, the big the galaxy from growing nicely by the by the sort of the the cold inflows coming in from the side. They are basically prevented to a certain degree, and um, this change of the flow pattern. The CGM, I think, is the reason why these two cosmic ray models, uh, in the end, don't make a, a, a large disk anymore. Even though the stellar mass is, is still still okay. Um, but you know, all these calculations we are still using a very simplified treatment of the interstellar medium. What we really need to do is to go to fully resolved uh, um, models of the interstellar medium. This is one attempt that we currently have: the so-called Smuggle model led by Marinacci here in this first introductory paper. You see now that this is a, a real multi-phase structure. This is uh, very similar to uh, approaches like the FIRE consortium, for example. So I think this is uh, basically a, a model of very similar uh, style and, and with similar residual uncertainties and uh, uh, you know, probably hopefully similar successes and failures. <laughs> we'll see. And uh, just for comparison, I show you here, this is from this is the Springer and Hernquist subgrid treatment um, of the ISM, a model from 2003 by now, still in use a lot. What uh, you see the difference here is that here the fragmentation uh, is prevented by a, by an explicit subgrid model for the for the that's pressurizing the ISM. You still get a disk system here, and uh, you also get a star formation rate by design that matches the observation data. So if you're only looking at the evolution of, say, the star formation rate of such a galaxy model as a function of time, 
we see that the, the smuggle result, which is the resolved interstellar medium, is you know, somewhat more noisy because you have all these individual uh, star clusters forming and the individual supernova explosions. And this smooth model produces a perfectly smooth uh, stop measure rate, which is, however, the same you know, on average. You know, the stellar mass is the same, the size is the same, but the ISM subgrid uh, structure is totally different. Right? So it's put under the rug with the subgrid treatment. And it all depends on what you want to achieve, of course. Whether such a simplified model is still good enough. I think it was good enough for a long time, but not anymore. We need to do better. And we need to improve also in other aspects. For example, we need to improve radiation fields. Here's an, uh, an attempt by Rosdahl to do this there. I mean, it's, it's also very much debated whether, we, for example, uh, how you precisely should model, say, in such galactic scales effects from uh, radiative tissue. Uh, for example, especially dust uh, uh, effects and, and radiation pressure on dust, which is found here in these models to basically no no role um, in the end on the on these on these scales. Um, we also have uh, now uh, finally an RT solve in our code, which we are trying to apply now to models of cosmic ionization. Uh, this is a moment-based <coughs> technique, which is reasonably fast. So uh, uh, stay tuned for these for results with our comments. Uh, implementation of our RepRT, which is a moment-based full uh, radiative transfer solver, which we can run in large volumes and also for isolated galaxies. So that's one thing we want to work on now. Um, and of course, to do these calculations, I just want to make a pitch that uh, really it requires uh, to also invest time on working on more accurate and scalable codes. That is not a very popular direction to go normally, but somebody, I think, has to has to bite the bullet. And since this is the Center for Computational Astrophysics, I felt I'm allowed to make a pitch to <laughs> that this is also worthwhile and interesting. So we are, for example, uh, Rainer Weinberger helped me to, to make the uh, repo code public, at least in, in a basic version. So we have this, this code. And, and the real code is about 335,000 lines. You see, this is a, a, a multi many years in, of investment. You can only produce this and maintain and improve with large teams. And this public code was cleaned up to a much uh, more manageable base. And we'll soon have a, a new code, Gadget 4, which is uh, revised in its, in its code base and hopefully much cleaner and has some interesting options. So that should come out uh, soonish as well. But maybe you, uh, you, one should also sometimes think, you know, maybe going back to the drawing board and think about the mathematics that's behind the methods. And here, for example, if you talk to an applied mathematician about how should you do how should you solve the Euler equations? They will typically tell you you should use discontinuous Galerkin methods. And so this is the hyperbolic system of ideal high dynamics. And, you, and instead of using the standard uh, sort of finite volume schemes that are uh, used with reconstruction techniques, and um, you can also convert this to a weak formulation of this PDE. And you then basically represent in every uh, resolution element, which can be a, a Q, but could also be a a uh, triangle or any other different geometric shape, you basically use the finite element method. You expand the solution inside this element into a, a basis. So the Lagrange polynomials, for example, are popular. And um, then you evolve uh, through this equation, you evolve uh, via uh, flux computations and internal integrations or uh, some uh, Gauss points through this volume. You evolve the expansion coefficients directly. And you're not throwing away the values of the time step. That's done in the normal finite volume methods, but you're keeping them. And that gives you a much higher computation efficiency. And then if you, you, know, if you look at the same number of degrees of freedom, the question if you, is, for example, if you suppose you want to approximate this solution here, the dashed line, numerically through some discretization scheme, you can do this in a piecewise constant way. This would be this red approach here with a certain number of degrees of freedom at zeroth order. At first order, you would make a piecewise linear, piecewise uh, um, parabolic, and then uh, you have a, a cubic uh, quartic uh, polynomial here. And in, you see, now you have only three bins here, three resolution elements, but you have a higher order representation of the solution. And this solution here is, or this, this uh, purple line, approximates what you want much better, even though you have the same storage requirement and the same number of degrees of freedom. And that's just an illustration that maybe going to these higher order schemes does give you higher accuracy for cheaper uh, computation effort. And this is indeed true. You can show these higher order methods are faster uh, than, say, finite volume methods at second order. And they very easily generalize to higher, higher order. 
Um, so DG, you know, we, we have this also in MHD to, to seventh order now on an adaptive Cartesian grid in, a, in one variant of our code. And you can then show for certain types of problems, you get uh, higher accuracy for given investment of uh, CPU. Right? And so the question then will be in the future whether you can really apply that to astronomical problems of interest. Because one thing is, and uh, that's what we learned, is that these higher order discontinuous scale methods, they are really very neat and fast and accurate. And they are like uh, tuned Formula One race cars, you know, and these are very fragile action machineries, right? So they, you know, if you hit them a little bit, they don't work properly anymore. And, and uh, what we sometimes base need is also <laughs> make their way through the mud, right? And that's, that's why we're currently uncertain whether we can get these higher order methods, which for smooth problems are definitely the way to go. For example, if you want to study just driven turbulence, it's one of the disciplines where these models are, these codes are really shining and they are uh, declassifying basically the finite volume methods in terms of efficiency and accuracy. There you can uh, apply them, but you know, in a, in a messy uh, TNG-like simulation, you need also source terms that are discretized at higher order, otherwise including the self-gravity. That's a problem we haven't really solved yet, and that's why we currently can't use it. And the other thing that's always needs to be done is to scale the codes to very large processor numbers. That's something that is uh, here just a, a, a verb of progress here for a big scaling plot for the sketched four code, where you see that here we go up to 50,000 cores, and it, it works perfectly in the three gravity, not so perfectly in the long range PM gravity, but overall uh, decently. So this is sort of the, the work we need to do because the exascale systems that are, are coming uh, also in the US, they of course, there you have to exploit concurrency uh, going not only to 10 to the five uh, processing elements, but 10 to the six, that's 10 to the seven or, or beyond that. And, and that's, uh, I think it's going to be very hard to do this for any uh, interesting problem in cosmology. Um, and you have to adopt GPU computing as well. So I, I let me just uh, give you some take-home points. Um, so I, I try to give you a bit of a, a tour of uh, the history of high dynamical simulation of galaxy formation, Lambda CDM. So um, they are actually stunningly successful, I'd say. You know, I, I, um, I, I was very desperate for a while to make it this galaxy 10 years ago. I was very desperate, but now suddenly we get them. They, they do work really uh, stunningly uh, well, uh, but uh, it shouldn't hide, uh, or the new challenge now is of course to, to do what, what we parameterize the small scale physics better. Uh, that's a multi-scale, multi-physics problem. Um, I think simulations will be very much necessary to eventually uh, nail it. Um, and I should say that that's where you know, the small uh, collaboration here is, is exactly addressing this challenge, how to how to link the different understanding and models and codes we have from very tiny scales of individual stars and their explosion of supernova all the way up, basically, to the whole universe. And um, that's a, a challenge at the moment. Um, but uh, I'm, after this meeting also here, uh, the last days, I'm, I'm actually quite uplifted that this eventually will be possible with all, all you guys. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, really excellent talk. Thank you for that overview. Uh, you talked some about the small scale dynamo in the ISM and in the CGM, and then you showed a comparison of Smuggle and a similar galaxy using the Springle and Hernquist model. Now, that much smoother ISM using Springle and Hernquist, I presume, is a less efficient or more, it changes the small scale dynamo. I wonder if you can say anything about the resulting magnetic field strength when you start to resolve the phase structure a little more. Yeah, it, it is true. The, um, you're absolutely right that uh, with the smooth model, you will you will kill part of the well, you kill mu much of the small scale dynamo in the interstellar medium itself. We still get a strong amplification in this case, but we think it's slowed down substantially. The, the, the issue is that the small scale dynamo, if it's really operating, it is uh, driven by the smallest eddy turnover type scales, which are very very short. So you then get exponential growth on basically tens of mega years or. 100, 100 mega years. 
And so the, once this kicks in, there's the field strengths. Um, we start with a, with a tiny 10 to the minus 14 Gauss seed field. Uh, you could see it also from stars or Biermann batteries or so. We put this in by hand at the moment. But one, this is then picked up, and the field is exploding in a few hundred mega years up to saturation, right? And what, what, you, what I think we're getting wrong, basically, with this smooth model is that we, we're actually seeing the amplification even too late. But the final state, we think, is fairly similar. Right? The final field strength is just basically given by the saturation point when the magnetic forces become uh, important relative uh, of comparable size to the thermal pressure gradients. And that's always the same. And that's also why I think we get the final uh, field strength roughly correct, because we sort of get the right pressure in the interstellar medium. And then that setting, ultimately, at the B field strength, we basically end up with something of order equipartition. Uh, it's a bit more complicated because of the rotation, uh, but still, it's close to a repetition. It's a bit weaker than that. Yeah. So, but you're right. I mean, we, I'm not saying that we're getting the magnetic field amplification correct. We know that the speed of which we also with resolution, with a high resolution at cosmological scales, so this typically starts at high redshift already in the in the turbulent flows. And if you have high resolution, the amplification starts earlier. It's faster because we have smaller scales resolved. Final field is the same as well. Thank you. So you showed this uh, deviation from the uh, Bowley and Rex. Yeah. Do you, in our in our galaxy, the bar plays a significant role in its dynamics, and it's pr probably scatters dark matter, the bar dark matter interaction um, is happening through pretty high order resonances. Mm -hmm. Do you think the numerical codes right now have the resolution? that they're properly capturing what's going on dynamically with things like bars on the Kelp parsec scale? I think so they're beginning to do that. So that's also a new development that you can do real gal credible galactic dynamics with cosmological simulations. That's a new development. I, I, I think it's somewhat borderline, but um, certainly bars and the pattern speed of bars and so on, you can start to predict, uh, I think, in a reasonable credible way with uh, the best cosmological simulations. So like the best fire ones or the best Auriga ones are able to, I would say, ran, run. So that maybe not all the nitty gritty details of, of spiral arm dynamics and so on, that, that I would not think is possible yet. But bars and um, pattern speeds and uh, are possible, I think. But dynamical friction, I think, is the bar, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the bar halo interactions are pretty important there. Yeah, that's and right. I, yeah. I mean, I have this very old prejudice from mm -hmm. visiting Lars in Santa Cruz and looking at orbits in the, you know, the, in the models and watching bar, box orbits, code the loop orbits, and back and forth. You yeah. know, this is many, many generations ago. But yeah, yeah. It, but it is a, it's a very demanding problem to get right at this. I, I, yes, and the resonances are very sharp and so on. And I, I think, you know, uh, especially if you have very symmetric potentials. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the, uh, for example, the pattern speeds of bars. Now we, for the first time, seen our Riga, the, the correct pattern speeds of bars and, and um, robustly with resolution. So uh, that's a measure, but, you know, the, um, some of the resonant phenomena possible, I agree, that, that we still wash this out in our in-body noise. But, <coughs> However, I, I would now say, you know, um, because traditionally, uh, lots of the galactic dynamic studies have used toy simulations mm -hmm. uh, to get the particle number up high enough and so on. And, and that makes a number of uh, simplifications that are maybe not, that are, for example, in no substructures that is flying around all the time, no infall, no, no satellites, no asymmetries, no tidal fields from surrounding structures. And all of that you get for free in a cosmological case. And so I think now, if I was purely interested in the system, uh, in the galactic dynamic problem, I would try to push the resolution further in the galactic case, because I think that's the much more promising way. With the isolated toy, studies you can you, you you know have so many arbitrariness in the initial conditions that's that's the key advantage of the cosmological simulation there's no freedom in the how you get to your system it's it's um the yeah, numerical parameters okay in terms of resolution but other than that you know while in the isolated case you you, you know yeah the whole structure and, and even the initial conditions depend depend sensitively on how you how you construct your distribution function 
for the disk and somehow stable it is and, and that's coming for free. Uh, that's why I believe that uh, galactic dynamic studies are better off turning to the cosmological simulations now. Um, Volker, going back to your simulation um, of uh, the merger of two massive stars, very interesting results. So one of the big challenges is to want to explain magnetize uh, massive stars is to show that the magnetic field is in a stable configuration. So I believe at the end of your simulation you are showing mostly the total component of the field. And so yeah. that's unstable to the Taylor instability. And I'm wondering if you can comment on uh, uh, what you think will be the longer term evolution of the magnetic field from your snapshot of your simulation. Yeah, yeah as, as you probably are aware, we, we haven't tackled that. We cut off the, the calculation in 3D after like 10 days or so, and then mapped this to a one dimensional stellar evolution right. calculation. And, um, and that mapping uh, and also the viscous evolution of this torus is very unclear. Um, and I'm uh, um, I'm not sure what the, I, I I mean I guess my honest answer is I'm not really sure what dynamic is going yeah. to happen how this system will settle down how much mass it will shed. If you have something to say about the poloidal, if you have a large scale poloidal component of the field that emerges in the simulation, usually you will need the, the poloidal and the toroidal to be interlocked somehow so that yeah. the field will relax to a stable configuration. Yeah, but. Um, that's, I mean, a dynamical from the MHD point of view, I think it's a very uh, interesting problem, and also what type of reconnection effects you might have there and so on. So I, I really, except for giving the lame answer that we need to now run this longer, um, I, I cannot really say. I'm not an expert enough on these isolated stars. You know, this is sort of, I, uh, as you probably know, you are, you are the expert on that. So <laughs> um, that's why you asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, with that, uh, please join me in thanking Paul Kerrigan.